in this video, I'm planning on going over the solution for um, exam two. So this is the first problem, and it says complete the following table for refrigerant 134A. So all we're doing with this problem is looking up information on the, or properties on the tables. And the trick to doing this problem though is you need to figure out which phase you're in for each um, each one of these before you can um, before you can determine where you need to get the properties. So what I'm going to do is just label these A and B. And so I'm going to start with A. So for A, the first thing we want to do is determine what phase this is. So it gives us the pressure as 80. <clears throat> PSI absolute, and it gives us the enthalpy as 78 BTU per pound mass. So what we can do is we can go look at the table, and we can look up this particular pressure, and we and then we can see what the enthalpy is for the um, saturated liquid and the saturated vapor, and then see if the enthalpy that we're given is between those less less than the enthalpy of a saturated liquid or greater than the enthalpy of a saturated vapor. So basically what we want to see is is this enthalpy that we're given greater than the enthalpy of a saturated liquid or less than the enthalpy of a saturated vapor. And if it is then it's a saturated mixture. If it's greater than the set, than the enthalpy for the saturated vapor, it's a superheated vapor. If it's less than the enthalpy for the saturated liquid, it's a compressed liquid. Okay, so what we want to do is go look at the tables, and we want to make sure we're looking at the table for refrigerant 134A, and also we want to make sure we're looking at the table for English units because that's what we're given. So let's go look at the tables, and these are the tables that are in um, thermodynamics and engineering approach by CBK and this is the eighth edition although I think the tables are pretty much the same in all of the editions. So what I'm going to do is scroll down and find the tables that are in English units. Alright so here's the English unit table for saturated um, refrigerant 134A and so what we want to do is so what we want to do and we want to look at the pressure table since we were given pressure so we want to look at the table that we can look up our um, units in or we can look up our our properties under the pressure so we were given that our pressure was 80 psi absolute so that means that we're right here and I'm just going to go ahead and write down the, well, first of all, the, satur the temperature for saturated, um, for a saturated mixture at this pressure is 65.89. And what we're actually wanting to get right now is this, um, the enthalpy of the saturated liquid and the enthalpy of the saturated vapor. So what I'm going to do is, well, so we know that our enthalpy is given as 78. 78 falls between these two values, so we know that we have a saturated mixture. So that means that we know that the 65.89 degrees Fahrenheit has to be our temperature. And we're also going to want to get this um, value here for when we calculate the, um, the quality. So let's take those numbers and go back to this problem. All right, so we have, um, so we found that the enthalpy of the saturated liquid was, let's just write these down. So the enthalpy of the saturated liquid is 33.391 BTU per pound mass. And the enthalpy of the saturated vapor is 112.22 
BTU per pound mass. So basically, our given enthalpy falls between um, these two values, so that means that we have a saturated mixture. So I'm going to go ahead and put that here. So we know that this is a saturated mixture. That also means that the temperature is the saturation temperature, which we got off the table. So Tsat is equal to 65.89 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can put that here. So 65.89. The last thing we need to find is the quality. So X. And we know that um, the enthalpy is equal to the enthalpy of the saturated liquid plus the quality multiplied by the enthalpy of vaporization. And we can get this enthalpy of vaporization off the table, but if it wasn't, this is just equal to the enthalpy of the saturated vapor minus the enthalpy of the saturated liquid. So then what we can do, we know what all of these are. Like we know that, we know this, we know this. So we can solve for x. So if we do that, we get that the quality is equal to the enthalpy minus the enthalpy of the saturated liquid over the enthalpy of vaporization. So this is equal to 78 BTU per pound mass minus um, 33.391 BTU per pound mass over 78. And we got this off the table, but remember it's just the difference between these two. So 78.830 BTU per pound mass. So then this is equal to, and these all cancel, so, and this is a unitless quantity, so this is equal to 0 0.566. So what we can do is put this into this table, so 566. Alright, so that's the first one. Now the second one, we, we kind of do the same process. So we have the temperature and pressure and we need to find the enthalpy, possibly the quality, and the phase. So before we can, before we know what table we need to use to look up the enthalpy, we need to know what the phase is. So I'm going to go down here, just put B, and I'll just write down the information that we're given. So we're given that the temperature is equal to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, the pressure is equal to 70 PSI absolute, and so what we want to do is go look up the, so what I'm going to do, we want to find the phase. So we need the phase because we want to find the enthalpy, and we don't know what table to look at until we know what phase this um, refrigerant is in. And since we're given the temperature and pressure, what we can do is just go look up the saturation temperature at the given pressure and then see if our current temperature is greater than or, or less than that um, than that temperature. So if we do that, um, and I'm just looking, I'm just going to get this information off the same table we looked at earlier except now I'm going to be looking at the, um, actually I'm looking at the same table because I'm looking up Tsat at 70 PSI absolute, and this is equal to 58.30 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, our temperature, that means that our temperature, so 10 degrees Fahrenheit, is less than Tsat, which means that we have a compressed liquid. So, so what we can do is go up here and put compressed liquid in our phase description. And since it's a compressed liquid, that means that it's all liquid, so the quality doesn't mean anything. 
So we can put Na in that spot. And then we just need to find the enthalpy. And we're going to get the enthalpy off of... Well, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is go see if there's a compressed liquid table available for um, this temperature and pressure. So since there's not a compressed liquid table available for this temperature and pressure, what we're going to do is just assume that our compressed liquid is a saturated liquid. And the way we do that is we just go look up the enthalpy for a saturated liquid at the temperature given. So I'm looking at the um, saturated refrigerant 134A temperature table, and our temperature is 10 degrees, so that's right here. And so what we want is the enthalpy of the saturated liquid. So if we go over here, it's right here. So that's going to be, uh, that's our, we're going to, so this is an approximation, and we're basically just assuming that this compressed liquid is a saturated liquid, and we're doing that because the data isn't available for a compressed liquid. So that means that our um, enthalpy is equal to the enthalpy of a saturated liquid at 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And you want to remember to look this up at the temperature, not the pressure. So this is 15.308 BTU per pound mass. So then we're just going to go put that in this table. So this is 15.308. All right, now let's look at the second problem, and I hope that's readable. But it says, determine the enthalpy change, so delta H, of nitrogen in kilojoules per kilogram as it is heated from 600 to 1,000 Kelvin. And then it says, assume constant specific heat at average room temperature. So there are a couple ways that you can actually do this problem, but since the problem specifically says to assume constant specific heat at average temperature, you probably want to do this assuming the um, constant specific heat. But basically what we're looking for, so we're looking for delta H, and we know that delta H is equal to H2 minus H1. So really the one way that you can do this is you could look up the you can look up the data for um, the enthalpy at state 1 and state 2 on the nitrogen table, which is actually table A-18. So let's just go look at that table real quick. All right, so here's table A-18. And this has, this, so this is the ideal gas properties of nitrogen. And the the first thing that we probably want to do is determine, okay, well, is this ideal gas? All right, so we want to figure out if this is ideal gas or not. And so what we're going to do is look at table A-1, which has the critical point properties for various gases. We're interested in nitrogen. So the critical point temperature is 126.2. And the critical point pressure is 3.39 megapascals. Well, our temperature is ranging between 600 to 1,000 Kelvin, which is well above um, the critical temperature. And it doesn't really give a pressure. So we're assuming that it's... That we're, we're just assuming that it's a, a pretty low pressure compared to the critical pressure. So basically, since this is a high temperature, low pressure, compared to the critical properties, we can assume that this is, in fact, an ideal gas. So let's go back to this table, A-18. The ideal gas properties of nitrogen. And so what we want to do is look up the enthalpy, because that's what we're interested in, is the enthalpy at state 2 and the enthalpy at state 1. So we want to look, look up the enthalpy at our um, temperature. So... First of, the first temperature is 600 Kelvin, which is right here. And the enthalpy is 17.563 kilojoules per kilomole. And then if we look up the 
enthalpy at the second temperature, which is a thousand. And that's right, that's on this table. So a thousand is right there. The enthalpy is 30,129 kilojoules per kilomole. So what we're going to do is go back to our problem and just write down delta H is equal to, so let's just write these over here. So H2, so this was at 1,000 Kelvin. This is equal to 30,129 kilojoules per kilomole. And H1, so the enthalpy at 600 Kelvin, is equal to 17,563 kilojoules per kilomole. So now what we want to do is just subtract these. So um, this is going to be 30,129 minus 17,563. These are kilojoules per kilomole. And then the problem says that it wants the answer in kilojoules per kilogram. So we're going to need to um, we're going to need to convert the kilomoles to kilograms. So we do that with the molar mass. The molar mass of nitrogen, so N2, is 28 kilograms per kilomole. So that means we want the kilomoles to cancel. So we need kilomoles on top and then 28 kilograms cancels and we have units of kilojoules per kilogram. This works out to 449 kilojoules per kilogram. So this is one way to do this problem. The second way, and so this is just looking up data straight from the tables, and this is possible with nitrogen because there happens to be a table, and there happens to be a table for air and I think oxygen, but if you're dealing with a gas that a table isn't available, you're going to need to calculate the change in enthalpy some other way. And so the second way that you can do this problem is you can assume a specific heat. And this, uh, this problem tells you to assume constant specific heat at room temperature. So it turns out that the easiest way to do this problem is to just assume the constant specific heat at room temperature. And if we do that, then delta, the change in enthalpy, is equal to um, C sub P average, so C sub P at average temperature, multiplied by T2 minus T1. And we need C sub P because we want enthalpy. So let's, um, let's look up what C sub P is at the average temperature. So the average temperature is equal to 1,000 plus 600 divided by 2, which is equal to 800 Kelvin. So then what we do is we go to the table. So I'm at table A-2, and this says that this is um, ideal gas specific heats at various common gases. We've already determined this is an ideal gas, so we can, we're good with using these. And we have nitrogen, so we're going to look here. And our average temperature is 800 Kelvin, which is right here. And we want C sub P, which is here. So what we're going to do is just go over here. And that means that C sub P is 1.121 kilojoules kilogram Kelvin. Let's go back to our problem. And we... So we got C sub P average from the table. It's equal to 1.121 kilojoules kilogram Kelvin. So now we can just calculate delta H. We know C sub P. We know T2 and T1. So the change in enthalpy is equal to 1.121 kilojoules kilogram Kelvin multiplied by T2 minus T1, which is 1,000 minus 600 Kelvin. The Kelvins cancel, and this works out to 
448 kilojoules per kilogram. So either one of these answers would have been correct. Either way of doing this is correct. But sometimes if the problem gives you an assumption, it, it'll make the problem easier to just use that assumption and, um, and go that route. All right, now let's look at this next problem. So this one says that we have a piston cylinder device that initially contains 0 0.7 meters cubed of nitrogen. So I'm going to draw my um, piston cylinder device. It has nitrogen. And it says that the volume, and it says vol initially the volume is um, 0 0.07, so that means the volume is going to change. So V1 is 0 0.07 meters cubed. And it says that, so it contains 0 0.07 meters cubed of nitrogen gas at 130 kilopascals and 180 degrees C. That means that P1 is equal to 130 kilopascals and T1 is equal to 180 degrees Celsius. And then it says the nitrogen is now expanded, so that means that it's expanding. Um, to a pressure of 80 kilopascals, so P2 is equal to 80 kilopascals. And it says that it's polytropic, and it gives us the polytropic exponent of 1.395. So that means that P1, V1 to the 1.395 is equal to P2, V2 to the 1.395. And then it says determine the boundary work done during the process. So we want to find the boundary work. And there's no other work in this, uh, as far as we know, there's no other work in this device. It doesn't say there's a heater. It doesn't say that like, there's no electrical heating. There's no paddle wheel. But that wouldn't really matter anyway because it's telling us to find the boundary work um, so we would just find the boundary work. So we, we have all of our information that we were given written down. Um, it doesn't look like, so there's, it's not constant pressure, it's not constant volume, um, so we don't know V2. And we also don't know T2, so I'm just going to put that down. Um, so let's make some assumptions. So first of all, we already know that it's polytropic, so we can put that in our list. And we have nitrogen gas, so we want to know if the gas is ideal. Um, so we, so we want to know if this is ideal. So to do that, we're going to look up the critical pressure and temperature and then compare those to our current pressure and temperature. So the critical temperature is 126. 0.2 Kelvin, and these are just from table A-1. The critical pressure is 3.39 megapascals. And so since our temperature is 180 degrees Celsius, um, that's so 180 plus 273 for Kelvin, we have a really high temperature compared to the critical temperature. And we also have a really low pressure compared to the um, compared to the critical pressure. So we basically have a high temp, low pressure compared to P critical, T critical. So that means that we can assume ideal gas. All right, now let's let's figure out what, what equations we're going to be using. So we have all of our problem information written down. Um, we have some assumptions. We have our drawing. We know what's going on. So basically, we just have nitrogen gas in a piston cylinder that's being expanded. And we know that it's, uh, that it's polytropic. So the equations that we're going to be using, it's telling us to find 
it's telling us to find the boundary work. So the boundary work is equal to P dV. And since we know that it's polytropic, then we know that the boundary work is equal to, like if we go through and um, solve this integration, this is equal to P2 V2 minus P1 V1 over 1 minus the um, polytropic index. Actually, this is 1 minus N. And if you, if you want to know how I went from this to this, I made a video on, um, on polytropic, on boundary work for polytropic gases. So go back and watch that and you'll see exactly how um, this is calculated. In general, if you're using this equation, you're not going to want to derive it, like rederive it each time, but it's important to know how, like where this equation comes from, like how we're solving this integration for the boundary work and getting this equation. And we're getting this equation because we're assuming that it's a polytropic um, expansion process. So if we look at this equation, we know P1 and P2 because they were given. We know the first volume because it was given. We know N because it was given, the polytropic index. The only thing we're missing is V2. So we're going to also need an equation to calculate V2. Well, since we know that this is a polytropic process, I already basically have the equation for that. I wrote it down up here. So let's rewrite that down here. So basically, since this is polytropic, we know that P1V1 to the 1.395 is equal to P2V2 to the 1.395. So then what we do is we just solve this equation for P2. So if we put in our pressure, so 130 kilopascal, um, V1 is 0 0.07, so this is to the 1.395, is equal to, and then P2 is 80 kilopascals, and we're looking for V2, so I'm just going to put that in, and then 1.395. So then if we solve this for, one, for V2, V2 is equal to 0 0.09914 meters cubed. Okay, so now we have, um, so if we go back up to our equation for the boundary work, we have P2, we have V2, we have P1, we have V1, and we have N. So we have everything we need to solve for the boundary work. So the boundary work is equal to, and I'm just going to rewrite this, so P2 V2 minus P1 V1 over 1 minus N, and then we just plug everything in, so this is equal to P2 is 80 kilopascals, V2 is what we just calculated, so 0 0.09914 meters cubed minus 130 kilopascal multiplied by 0 0.07 meters cubed and then this is all divided by 1 minus 1 1.395 and then our units look a little screwy but if we just look at so a pascal is kilogram meter second squared and a joule is kilogram meter squared second squared. So basically if we multiply the Pascal by meter cubed we're going to get kilogram meter squared second squared so we end up with joule. So this is our units are going to be in um, kilojoules. So this works out to 2.96 kilojoules for the boundary work. 
And this work is going to be positive because the system is doing work on the on the surroundings. All right, let's do number. Let's do the last one. So this says that we have a ten foot cube tank. So I'm going to draw the tank, and it says that it contains oxygen gas, and it tells us how much oxygen gas it has, so it tells us that the mass is 0 0.812 pound mass. And it says that it's initially at 14.7 PSI absolute, um, so P1, P1 is equal to 14.7 PSI absolute. And then it tells us that it's also at 540 Rankins, so T1 is, or the temperature at state 1 is equal to 540R. And then it says a paddle wheel within the tank is rotated. So that means that we have a paddle wheel. So basically that means we're going to have work input from the paddle wheel. So it says the paddle wheel within the tank is rotated until the pressure is 20 PSI absolute. So that means that P2 is equal to 20 PSI absolute. And it tells us that during, oh, and then it tells us, so the paddle wheel is in the tank is rotated until the pressure is 20 PSI absolute and the temperature is 735R. So T2 is equal to 735R. And it says during the process, 20 BTU of heat is lost to the surroundings. So we have Q out that's equal to 20 BTU and it says determine the paddle wheel work done. So we need to find the work in from the paddle wheel and it says neglect the energy stored in the paddle wheel. So basically what that means is we don't need to worry about any internal energy that's stored in the paddle wheel. So just from this problem statement we know that it doesn't tell us this is rigid but we're going to basically assume that it is because it doesn't say anything about the um, about a piston moving or the um, volume expanding or anything like that. So we're just going to assume that V1 is equal to V2 is equal to V and it also tells us the so the volume is 10 feet cube. So that's in the problem statement right there. And that looks like most of our information. Let's make some assumptions. So first of all, we, we want to know if this is ideal gas. Um, so let's so we have oxygen gas. Let's see if it's ideal. Um, the critical pressure for oxygen, and this would be on table A-1, is 736 PSI absolute. And the critical temperature, and remember it's table A-1 for English units. So remember to look at the English units and not the one with the metric units. So the temperature critical is 181 um, degrees Fahrenheit. Um, basically we have a really high temperature compared to our critical temperature and we also have a really low pressure compared to our um, critical pressure. So we have a high temp, low pressure. So we're going to assume ideal gas. And I should have probably converted this temperature Fahrenheit to um, Rankin. So this is 279R. So our temperatures are well above that temperature. Um, we can also assume, like it doesn't say anything about this tank moving or elevation changes. So we're going to assume that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the change in potential energy is equal to zero. So now we have all of our problem information written down. We know what we want to find. We're looking for the work input. And we have our assumptions. So now we need to write down the equation or equations 
that we're going to need to solve. Um, so we're going to be solving. So basically, since we're looking for the work input, we know there's heat out. Um, we need, we're going to be, and this work in is changing the internal energy of the system. Basically, we need to do an energy balance. So we're going to apply the first law. So Q minus W is equal to delta U plus delta KE plus delta PE. And this is the form of the first law for a um, simple compressible system, which is what we have. So we already know that, we already said that these two terms were zero. So basically we're left with Q minus W is equal to delta U. This delta U is equal to the mass, which we know, multiplied by U2 minus U1. All right, so we, so we know Q, Q was given. We're looking for the work, really, and we were given the mass. So what we need are um, the internal energy at, at state two and the internal energy at state one. So basically we need U2 and U1. So there are a couple ways we can do this and I'll show you both ways. The problem didn't say anything about assuming specific heats, but basically we can for this problem. But there's also a table available for oxygen. So you could either look up these internal energies on the um, oxygen table, or you could assume specific heats at, at the average temperature. So I'm just going to say C sub um, V average, and then this would be T2 minus T1. So let's do this both ways, like we did the previous problem, just so you can see how you would do this both ways. So for the first way, we're going to look up um, U2 and U1 on the table. So Q minus W is equal to M multiplied by U2 minus U1. So let's go to the table and get U2 and U1. So we're looking, we have oxygen gas, and our T2 is 735 Rankin, T1 is 540R. So if we go to the table, this is the ideal gas properties for oxygen, and we already determined this was an ideal gas, so we can use the properties from this table. And so all we do is look up U, or the internal energy, at the temperatures that we're interested in. So for U2, that's temperature 2 is 735 Rankin. So that's somewhere between these two. Um, so somewhere between these two values. So what we're going to need to do is just interpolate to get the value of the internal energy at um, 735 Rankin. So we're going to use this relation for the interpolation. So y minus y1 is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 multiplied by x minus x1. So then what we can do is just say, okay, well, let's say that the y's are the internal energy, the x's are the um, temperature. So then y, let's see if I can keep that on there. So we're looking for y, so y minus y1 Y1 is the internal energy at um, 720, so that's, no, at 740, so that's going to be um, 36, no, Y1 is the internal energy at 720, so that's going to be 3593.1 is equal to, and then we have Y2 minus Y1, so this is just going to be 36, 97.4 minus 35, 93.1. And then this is divided by our temperature range is 740 to 720. So this is going to be um, 740 minus 720. And then this is multiplied, the temperature we're interested in is 730 minus 720. So then if we solve for y, y is equal to 
so this is you, the internal energy, at um, 735 Rankin. So this is equal to U2. And the units are BTU per pound mole. So that's, um, that's our internal energy for um, state two. State one, the temperature is 540 Rankin. So that's right here. So that means that our internal energy is 2673.8. So now what we can do is go back to our problem and basically just plug these in. So we have the mass. Um, so we're looking for the work done. It says, so it says determine the paddle wheel work done. So I'm just going to determine the work in joules or kilojoules or actually, sorry, in this case we're in English units. So I'm, I'm going to determine the work in BTU and not BTU per um, pound. Okay, so the mass is 0 0.812 pound mass. So this is 0 0.812 pound mass. And then U2 was, we found that on the table, it was 36 71.3 minus 26 73.8 BTU per pound mole. Since this is in pound mole, we need to convert it to um, we need to convert it to pound mass. So we need to look up the molar mass of oxygen. Um, the molar mass of oxygen is 32 pound mass per pound mole. So what we're going to do is um, use this conversion. So 32, so we have one pound mole over 32 pound mass. So the pound moles cancel and then we have BTU per pound mass. These pound masses cancel and we're left with units of BTU. So let's calculate this. So this is, so we still have Q minus W, we're going to work on that in a minute, is equal to 25.3 BTU. Alright, so now let's look at so what we're actually looking for is the work. All we've calculated so far is a change in internal energy. So we know that we have some heat out. So Q is, um, it's 20 BTU out. So Q is negative 20 BTU minus the work is equal to 25.3 BTU. And then we have the negative so minus work, I'm just going to add the 20 BTU over. So we have 25.3 plus 20, and this is BTU. So this is equal to 45.3 BTU. And so the work is equal to negative 45.3 BTU. And this is negative because there, the work is input to the system, or it's work done on the system. So I'm going to put work is done on the system. All right, so this is one way that you can solve this problem. This is using the tables to look up delta U. So the other way that we can solve this, so you can either do this with the tables or you can use the specific heats. So we wrote down this equation. Um, so we can also solve this using a specific heat at average temperature. And this, if you didn't have the data in the tables, then you would have to use the specific heat at the average temperature or even at room temperature if you don't have a specific heat available for the average temperature. Um, so basically if you have a gas that you don't have a table for, so like if you have argon or 
xenon or like any other number of gases, you would have to use the specific heats to solve this problem. The only reason it was an option to look it up this time is because there happens to be a table that exists for um, oxygen gas. So let's solve this the other way because either way of solving this is fine. So the second way is Q minus W is equal to the mass multiplied by C sub V average multiplied by T2 minus T1. So what we need to do this time, the only thing we don't have is the C sub V at the average temperature. So let's calculate the average temperature. Um, the average temperature is let's see, 735 plus 540 divided by 2, which is 637.5 Rankin. So then what we're going to do is go to the tables and we're going to look up the specific heat for oxygen at 637.5. Alright, so here's our table and we're looking at table a-2e, so we're in English units, so we need to use the table that's in English units, and we're looking for um, C sub V, because we're calculating the internal energy, and oxygen, and our average temperature was 637, so it's somewhere between these two. So it's somewhere between 0 0.177 and 0 0.181. So what we can do is interpolate. So y1 minus, or y minus y1 is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 multiplied by x minus x1. So then, let's just say we're looking for y, so that's going to be the internal energy. So y1 is 0 0.177 is equal to 0 0.181 minus 0 0.177 divided by the temperatures, so um, 700 minus 600 multiplied by, and then the actual temperature is 637.5 minus 600. And this is minus so then what we can do is solve for y. So y is equal to 0 0.1785. So I'm just going to say that's one, oh, 0 0.179. And this is units of BTU per pound mass Rankine. So BTU per pound mass Rankine. So this is our specific heat. So this is C sub V at um, 637.5. So let's go back to our problem. Okay, so we have the specific heat. It's, so C sub V average is equal to 0 0.179 BTU pound mass Rankine. So then what we do is just um, start piecing this together. So we know that Q is, we have negative 20 BTU out. So Q is going to be negative 20 BTU minus work. Thus work is what we're looking for. Is equal to the mass, which is 0 0.812 pound mass multiplied by the specific heat which is 0 0.179 BTU pound mass Rankine. And then these are multiplied by T2 minus T1, which is 735 minus 540 Rankine. So Rankine cancels, pound mass cancels. We're left with BTU. So we have minus 20 BTU minus the work is equal to 28.34 B 
BTU. And so then our work is equal to 48.3 BTU. And this is negative. So the work is being done on the system. So that's why you get a negative sign for the work. So this is... So this is the second way that you can solve the problem using specific heats. So basically we have our energy balance, like if we go down here, so we have the Q minus W is equal to delta U. And basically the way we solve this is we need to calculate the change in internal energy. And we did this two different ways. First we looked up the values of the internal energy of state 1 and state 2 on the oxygen table. And the second way we did it was we assumed specific heats, and, or constant specific heats, and we calculated the specific heat at room, t or sorry, at the temperature, at the average temperature of our system. And then we, and then we could calculate delta U using specific heat. So you can do this two different ways. Um, you end up with a slightly different answer with each way, but um, either way of solving this is just fine.